I'm Brittany Rizzo and welcome to My Only Friends. I'm so excited about today's episode. I got to talk with one of the most beautiful humans inside and out, Nancy Travis. Nancy has starred in Three Men and a Baby, Three Men and a Little Lady, So I Married an Axe Murderer, Becker, Last Man Standing, and The Kaminsky Method. You can now catch her on Hallmark's new original series, Ride, as ranch owner Isabel McMurray. This episode reminds me of the Friends episode, the one where Ross and Rachel, you know, not only is this episode the one I remember most from watching Friends as a kid, but it's the first time we're introduced to Richard, played by Tom Selleck, who Nancy has worked with multiple times, and I was very jealous she got to marry him on screen, if I'm being honest. Nancy is truly so kind and someone I really look up to and getting to have this conversation was very special to me. Please enjoy my interview with Nancy Travis. Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to you. Thank you. What did you guys do yesterday? Uh, what did we do? Actually, it was, uh, it was a great day. I mean, I got my husband to walk the dogs with me and the new puppy, which um, because it's Mother's Day, everybody has to do everything. Oh, did you know I got a new puppy? No. Yes. I got a very cute new puppy. So we're a little, uh, the whole thing is just about watching this dog run around and make sure he doesn't pee anywhere. (laughs) Oh my gosh. What kind of dog? It's a cute little guy. I mean, I rescued him from Wagmore Pets and Mm -hmm. it was definitely an impulsive spur of the moment thing. Um, But I I don't know quite what he is. He's four months old, 13 pounds and (laughs) maybe Dachshund Jack Russell Terrier. But for all I know, could be a golden retriever. I have no idea. So, <laughs> what did you name him? Lou, short for Luigi. Oh yeah. my gosh, that's so cute. Yeah, he's very cute. Well, yeah. congratulations. Thank you. Good. So this is good. This is working out. That's amazing. Yeah, I I was like, it's so funny because you have boys and you're, you're a boy mom. But I also feel like you, I don't know why I'm like, you have daughters too, but I think it's because I know you from last man standing and I'm like, <laughs> and because of the way you treat me, like you have this like mama bear energy all the time. And you always have this kind of like, let me take you under your, under my wing energy. And like, I also know you from heart of Dixie where you kind of had that same type of character to Rachel Bilson on the show. Mm-hmm. So I, I was like, wait, does she have daughters? No, she doesn't have daughters. She's a boy mom. I think it also, I, I'm a, a, a classic Virgo. So it might be those qualities too. Yeah. But I do, I mean, I do like taking care of, and I love, uh, love animals, obviously Mm -hmm. two sons. Uh, I, I seem to be cast in roles though, where I have daughters. Yeah. I I haven't, although in ride, which I'm doing now is, um, I have three sons. So mm-hmm. whatever. I mean, I, 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 I become sort of a mom going all the way back to three men and a baby. One of my first jobs is, uh, is a mom. Okay. So I watched three men and a baby and three men and a little lady for the first time. And I was like, I was telling Roxy, that's how we know each other through Roxy. Yeah. And let me just say, I'm so excited that you're doing this because ever since I've met you, you and I have always just talked nonstop about what we're watching, what we think of it. And we're always asking each other, like, what are you watching right now? What are you watching right now? And you have always been so incredibly kind to me. And And well, likewise, I mean, (laughs) sure. (laughs) And it was just when I was preparing for this episode, I was like, how have I missed like I knew you were in three men and a baby and I had seen it when I was a kid but I don't remember I didn't remember it and I just remember everybody was like scared to watch it because they thought there was like a a ghost in the background but it was just like a Ted Danson poster (laughs) right supposedly I mean there's still um sort of uh spectral theorists out there yeah believe that there is a ghost and and it's hard to prove I mean we were on a soundstage so so it's hard I mean, we weren't exactly in a house where some child. Right. Right. Yeah. But I was going through like your credits and all the things you've worked on. And I was like, the fact that we've talked so much and she was you, like, you have never been like, oh, yeah, I worked with that person. Oh, yeah. Like, you're so humble. And I'm like looking through your IMDb like, holy crap. Like you work with Laura Linney, Tom Selleck, Ted Danson, like all these incredible um, Michael Douglas, Alan Arkin, like so many incredible people. 
and the how kind you are and how humble you are it's like you would never you never sit there and like brag about anything which i just think is so it's just a, a testament to how like lovely you are oh thank you i i i, I mean i also feel like i um i i do what i do for the craft of acting and i didn't come into this business thinking, oh gosh, I want to be famous or, oh, how, how close can I get to stars? Mm -hmm. It really is always for me pretty much been about the work. And I, I, uh, I've been lucky. I mean, I've been doing this a very long time and, uh, it, it seems like a lot of work, but there's, it's definitely been a bunch of highs and lows and, uh, and the lows just feel like, my God, the work will never come. And the highs are, I can't believe I'm doing this great job and working with great people. So um, I guess it's it's everybody's kind of story of being in this business. Right. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. So I was telling Roxy, I was like, I had no idea she had a British accent in this movie. And she was like, oh, her parents are from London, I think. And I well, was my like, dad is from Northern England. He's from a little town called Fleetwood by just outside of Blackpool, which mm-hmm. is way up there. Um, and he's got, I mean, I don't really hear the accent that much unless he's with other English people and then it comes on a bit stronger. Uh, and I, I think it's been diluted quite a bit being in this country all these years. Mm-hmm. But my mom is uh, Italian or was, and she passed away. But my mom uh, was a New Yorker, New York Italian. So it was a lot of different sounds growing up. <laughs> in- <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny a lot of different sounds that's so true those are very two very different, different accents. decibels also i mean my italian family is super loud and the english side is like oh my ears are hurting oh my yeah. ears are hurting <laughs> <laughs> so where where are you from originally i was born in new york uh, okay. my parents were living in queens at the time and I grew up in Maryland and Massachusetts and ended up back in New York to go to NYU. And now I'm in Los Angeles. When you were growing up, what were the shows that you were watching where you were like, I want to do that? Or was there a specific play you saw or like? Right. What? Well, we um, we were allowed an hour of TV a day. So which is an interesting concept when you think of how much time we all spend on screens now. And I would come up from school and I remember there was the Partridge family, which actually I think was a nighttime show, but there was the Adams family. Uh, uh, For a time there was, well, there was a show. I can't remember what it was called, but it came from the movie seven brides for seven brothers, Mm -hmm. which was a musical, a great musical. And I'm trying to remember the name of the show, which is escaping me, but uh, I could Google that. Uh, so I watched that. I watched the Brady Bunch. Um, these were all sort of the seminal shows. And then, of course, Carol Burnett, which was uh, one of my favorites, the Carol Burnett show. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember laughing. I mean, I'm, just, I'm sort of dating myself saying all these shows. That no, I watched all these, too. <laughs> the golden era of TV, in a way. Truly. Um, and then, you know, later was the Mod Squad. Things got a little different. Um, uh, there was ABC had an after school special, which I did one uh, when I was first starting out, which was a great thing. There were movies that were on in the afternoon, which is kind of a cool concept um, for, for young people. And I'm just trying to think. God, there were so many. You know what? Um, there was also, I don't know if people remember, but Fat Albert. Do you remember that? Yes, I remember that. Yeah, I love yeah. that show. That's <laughs> great. Uh, and you know, and I'm just trying to think. I mean, I it, it's funny because as I, I I would watch these shows religiously and love them, and then um, oh, Starsky and Hutch. I mean, just oh, mm-hmm. these, they're all coming back to me. But uh, then later, I mean, I just didn't really watch TV as much. And I love to read. So I would spend my time doing that. Uh, and I would watch movies and things in TV shows for parts. But now, now that I'm married and uh, I, I tend to binge watch things with my husband, shows that we we like. And we we recently, I mean, <clears throat> we binge watched Your Honor, which I loved. Um 
and I'm trying to think of what else, making of a murderer, various documentaries and things mm-hmm. like that, which is great. I highly recommend it. And I just watched Waco and Waco, the aftermath, which was really great. So it, yeah. it's not, it's, it's more serious fare. Right. Well, when you were younger though, was it like, was it Carol Burnett where you were like, I want to be just like that. I want to do this. I thought that she was genuinely funny. Yeah. And especially in the like laugh out loud. And, and I, I realized the things that, that I find humor in it's physical comedy. Mm -hmm. So whenever somebody does a pratfall or, or there's some kind of double take or some kind of movement or fake fall or spit take or something. I mean, those are the things that make me laugh. Yeah. Uh, and she was the queen of that as well. Lucille Ball too. I mean, yeah, right. Say that. Yeah. And, and, and just also the moments where she, they would be Jim Conway, Har, uh, Harvey, what's his name? Who's was in it also. I can't remember his name. Oh, I know. And I Harvey just Corman. Oh, Harvey yes. Corman. Uh, and Carol Lawrence, I mean, the four of them and when they would be cracking up and who could hold it the longest. I mean, love that stuff. Mm -hmm. So did you, you went to NYU, you said. I did. So you, did you start out like heavily in theater before you got your first role on TV or film? I, well, I went to NYU and we, a bunch of us were graduating at the same time when we formed a theater company called Naked Angels. And it was a lot of people who are actually very successful now, but but we were just trying because we couldn't get work and we were pal- all pounding the pavements and didn't know what to do with all of our energy and excess creativity and just desire to be all that. Uh, we formed this theater company and we would do play readings. And then we started doing our own productions and fundraisers. And it became uh, a bit of an iconic theater company at the time. And uh, it's still active today oh. and still a member, I guess, like because what you remember, you're a lifelong member. Yeah. But uh, it was great. And we had people in the company like Rob Morrow and Gina Gershon, Fisher Stevens um, and Robbie Bates, who's a terrific playwright. And it was just a, a, a Kenny Lonergan, which is a really interesting, eclectic, talented, talented group of people. Mm-hmm. So that happened. And then the first sort of paying thing that, uh, it happened were commercials mm. and the, the, uh, an agent named Sue King at J. Michael Bloom in, in New York was the first person to say, I think this woman has some talent in some way. <laughs> so that led to, uh, a string of great commercials for Levi's and Hostess Cupcakes and et cetera, and yada, 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 so many commercials. Uh, so that was kind of a, a good thing. And then one thing led to the next. Um, there was no great bombshell of boom. We discovered her waiting tables and here she is. I, I mean, it was all art auditioning and hard work and hard work. I was understudying uh, in a play called I'm Not Rappaport on Broadway. And uh, when I did get to go on, there was a casting director that saw me that um, is the casting director that brought me in for Three Minute a Baby. So mm-hmm. that all started to happen. And um, and that audition went very well. And it, the movie was going to be directed by a French director. And I think it's the same director that directed the original because it's it, based on a French movie. And um, then it came around that they said, well, it's not going to go to you. We're looking for an English actress. And I said, well, I can do an accent. I can do the English accent. Let me read again. And by then it was being directed by Leonard Nimoy. Mm-hmm. And I auditioned again and got the part. So that was, that was, I would say probably my big break. That's so amazing. And look, I have the biggest crush on Ted Danson still, like <laughs> even today. Why wouldn't you? He's, I know. He, he's crazy and lovely. And I've worked with him a number of times. And it's funny how those circles, you know, those connections keep circling back to each other. I was going to ask you is that like you've worked with Ted Danson and Alan Arkin was also in So I Married an Axe Murderer mm-hmm. and um, Tom Selleck. You worked with him again after Three Men and a Baby. So yeah. were those just like happenstance or did you guys stay connected? And it was like, oh, Nancy would be great for this part. Happenstance. It completely happenstance. And I mean, the good news is, is when it came up again, they were very uh, welcoming and um, 
and advocated for me for, mm. for those jobs. So that that was a good thing. Yeah. Do you have any fun stories of Ted Danson and them on set? Were they like pranksters or were they always doing bits I, or I something? Mean, I'm trying to remember. I I in in the first one I wasn't in it that much, but three men and a little lady I was. Mm-hmm. And uh it was just a very fun time. The the second one, Three Men and a Little Lady, was directed by Emil Ardolino and uh who's who's passed away. But I mean, I don't have any specific stories of them and we're going way back. <laughs> but uh but they were they were just very, very lovely and uh and we we had a good time making it. Yeah. And of course I'm like, wow, Tom Selleck was so hot too. <laughs> Like I'm watching it and like I watched it with my mom and dad while I was home last and my mom and I were looking at each other like, oh, he is so hot. <laughs> He's the nicest man. And I have to say, I, I mean, I he did. He had a ranch at the time. He probably still does. I don't know. But at the time um, he would talk to me about his ranch and his horses and I guess one of his horses was about to foal. And he said, if you want to come over, you can come. And, and this is an exciting thing. And uh, I wish I had gone because I think I um, and here I am all these years later in ride and falling in love with horses. Yeah. And so that, I don't know. That's a story that goes nowhere. But <laughs> no, it's it <laughs> all connects. Of how open he is and just how friendly and kind mm-hmm. and um mm-hmm. You know, he, he's a Hollywood legend for a reason. And I don't think anybody has a bad thing to say about him. He's uh, he's a great guy. Yeah. So I know him from Friends, obviously, because he played Monica's boyfriend, Richard, on there. Right. And okay. you've been you've been working in this industry and especially during the height of all those shows. Did you ever audition for Friends? No. That's no, so I shocking did. to me. I feel I like. Did. Yeah. yeah. I do remember, though, thinking back um, because I, I, I want to watch Michael J. Fox's documentary mm-hmm. uh, and, and I did get to work with him. We worked on a movie called Greedy. And um, I remember way back uh, when we were all trying out for the same things, I did audition for his girlfriend in Family Ties. So, mm. uh, yeah, that went to Tracy Pollan and, and they're who's amazing and they're happily married all these years later but it is it is interesting how we're all just jockeying for roles and you never know what's going to happen right and so you do three men and a baby and three men and a little lady and then you also do i mean a string of movies it seems like after that and you've done really well in the comedy world, I would say. Do you have a preference of doing comedy or drama? Because I feel like, well, I mean, comedy is so rooted in reality. And I feel like in drama also, like, because it's real for you. You're not trying to be funny. But do you have a preference over one or the other? Like, would you prefer to be on a sitcom again? Or do you just, you love it all? I, I don't really have a preference. And and honestly, I would to me, they're very much aligned. They're, mm-hmm. they're, they really are the two faces of the, of the theater drama mask. And, and even in the most, the darkest dramas, there's comedy there. And, and I try to find the comedy in, in whatever I do, because I do think it's a facet of life it, it, that is um, paired with, with everything and there's there's always that other side to look at things, and even in comedy, sometimes I, I wh- what is real about it, and what where is the the pathos in it? Uh, so I, I do think they're almost one and the same, and they're both kind of about timing. Mm-hmm. So, uh, and that is the cliche. Um, what's the most important thing in comedy? To to timing. But. Yeah, they're, they're kind of the same. So I don't. So to answer your question, I don't really have a preference. I I like both. Yeah, it's interesting because I feel like there's not a lot of sitcoms anymore that are that have reached. I mean, like you were on Last Man for nine seasons. Yeah. yeah. And I feel like that is like the last long running sitcom. What do you think that is? Like, why do you think that there are these sitcoms out there that aren't lasting? don't know. I think, I think it's an art form that 
doesn't get a lot of credit for how difficult it really is. Mm-hmm. And I think to craft a a, a sitcom and, and we're talking about the, the form that uses four cameras. It's not a single camera that's filmed like a movie. It's, it's right. actually four cameras on a soundstage. Uh, there's a technique to doing that. And I just don't know that that people are investing in it in the same way. And I don't mean just financially, but but um, creatively. And it is a hard thing to put together and a hard thing to to be good at. And I, you're right. I mean, I just don't even know. I mean, I think people, I'm not sure, maybe just want more difficult plots. It's hard to say, because at the same time, I do think a lot of people watch television. And even that, I mean, you have to say, is that a thing of the past as well? Watching yeah. television, it almost sounds like a, a, a 1950s relic. <laughs> <laughs> So, you, know, I, you know, we're having this conversation, but we're in the midst of all of these things changing. Yeah. And we're we're we have writers on strike now trying to make a, a claim for for their positions in, in the face of artificial intelligence. So so how is it all going to change? I remember the last time the actors went on strike, we were we were bargaining for uh, streaming representation with streaming. So. It, it it's just changing very dynamically and very quickly. And we're not quite sure what it's going to be. So it's hard to stake a claim for any of it. Right. Are you hopeful about it? Cause I feel like a lot of people, like I was talking to my friend about it the other day and I'm like, I feel like I'm hearing so much chatter that's making me go, why did I choose this career? Like, should I just stop and go get a regular job? Like, and then I'm like, okay, no, 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 no ebbs and flows. This will come to an end. We're going to figure this out. And when the strike ends, it's going to be great for all of us. Like I have to have this like conversation all the time. So how are you feeling? Are you feeling hopeful like that we're going to come to a resolution here? Yeah, I'm actually feeling more than hopeful. And I I do think that this is the nature of what we do. Mm -hmm. And and as much as we like to say it's about creativity and compensation, it's also business. It, this is our business. This is what we do for a living. And from the beginning of time, it's it's hard to marry those two. I mean, not that I want this to be an omen, but Vincent Van Gogh wasn't even recognized until after he died. Mm-hmm. I mean, so his his paintings are now worth, I can't even imagine how much. But I, I do think that technology comes along and we all get very frightened. I remember when the, the notion of the internet was introduced, we're all like, Oh no, this yeah. is going to be terrible. The internet. And, and who doesn't live without the internet? Look at the access we have. It's extraordinary. Right. I, I think for creative people, we, we have to find our place with all of these things. I mean, even with streaming, we, it was just, what is that going to mean? How is that going to be? And if we're saying goodbye to 22 episodes, we just have to figure out the new formula. And and I think that's what the struggle is right now is, is what is the new formula so that everyone it's fair, right. whatever that even means. I mean, what, what has ever really been fair, but, but that is the struggle. And I think it all bodes well in a good way. And I do think that, for whatever happens, you can't replace creativity. Mm-hmm. I mean, even AI needs somebody to like the spark for it to, to generate. So you need it. And, um, and, and I believe that I believe in, in the creative process and creative minds and, um, and we just have to make sure the pie is divided for mm-hmm. everyone. But mm-hmm. I, I do think that the possibilities are, are great. We just okay. have to figure what they are. See, I always feel good hearing that from you because it's like, like I said, you're like a a mama bear, like you're, you've taken many of us under your wing and everybody is always like, you know, Krista has talked about you on this podcast. Molly has talked about you on this podcast of just like how they've gone to you. And I'm like, okay, well, if Nancy says it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. (laughs) I mean, look at Eve, here we are doing a podcast. Right. So not that long ago, the idea of this and this access that you could do your own thing like this Mm -hmm. it was unheard of and Mm -hmm. people can now take a phone and make a movie and release it and and make money from that so so i i think we have to look at the possibilities rather than the handicaps yes yes i love that that's a great way to put it 
coming back to the shows that you watch, Mm -hmm. I can't help but notice the incredibly stark difference between the Brady Bunch and the Partridge family to making a murder. (laughs) (laughs) I know. I know. So I'm like, it's so funny because I am the world's biggest baby. I'm rewatching Boy Meets World right now, and I skipped two episodes because they scare me. So I, I'm like making a murder. Like, why do you think you gravitate towards those shows, those dark suspense crime dramas? Yeah, I, I don't know. But I, I love the notion of puzzles and mm. how how does this all work out? What are the clues? I love I don't like to be frightened. I mean, mm-hmm. I don't like horror things um, like I'm not one to go see a horror movie or watch a horror show yeah. necessarily. Uh, I would act in one, <laughs> but yeah. I wouldn't necessarily go see it. But, but I do like suspense and intrigue and who done it and how is this all going to work out? I, I like to read those kind of stories uh, and, and it, it, it's thrilling to me. So if it's not something that's emotional or really, really humorous, that I mean, I, I like to watch stand up specials also, stand up comedians, because I, I like to laugh. Uh, and then even the other night, we were watching The Jewish Matchmaker, which <laughs> I would say I'm not one for reality shows at all. But yeah. I was sucked in and I, I thought it, I think it's terrific. And, <laughs> and when you think about it, that here's a tradition that has been in the Jewish community from at the beginning of time, a matchmaker and is still in Orthodox communities, the way that marriages are made. But you, you have this matchmaker basically operating like the human version of hinge. And it's fascinating. It's, it's really great. <laughs> I love that. You know, what hinges, even though you're married. Well, you have two sons. Uh, yeah, I have two sons. Yeah, <laughs> so I, I, know what it is. I don't know how to get on or word of all of it, but I know what it is. <laughs> oh God. You couldn't pay me to get on a single dating app. That's how I feel. Maybe I'll be on one of those. My sons don't hesitate to mock me at my ignorance of things like that. Um, (laughs) So I try to stand on top of it just for my own, uh, my own ego. (laughs) Yeah. That's so funny that you, I've never heard somebody equate it to like liking puzzles and liking to piece things together. Cause I've always been like, why does anybody want to watch like this, like, murder documentary like stuff like that is like it puts me on edge and i am the spoiler queen like i will like i watched ozark for example oh yeah ozark was great i watched that too that was i had to fast forward through the entire episode to see it on the clips to see who died Oh, so interesting. I can rewind yeah. it and then watch it and know like because then I'm, I'm not going to enjoy it if I'm on the edge of my seat the whole time. I'll just be anxious. I'll be walking around. I start cleaning. I start looking at it through my eyes like I can't. Well, why is that? Why does it make you anxious? What is that? I think not knowing what's going to happen next. Like I don't want something to take me by surprise. Mm-hmm. And I just, I don't like being scared. I don't like things popping out at me. I don't like the dark. <laughs> like, I don't like violence. It took me a while even to watch Marvel movies. Cause like those action scenes of just like straight fighting and killing for 10 minutes. I'm like, this is too, it's too stressful to me. I feel like if I have a moment and I'm going to watch something, I want it to make me laugh. Mm-hmm. Like that's all I, I always want to feel happy. I always want to laugh. Like the world is scary enough. I don't want to in these four walls. It's just got to be funny. <laughs> that's interesting. I mean, I don't like in my, uh, in my life, I don't like the rug being pulled out from under me. I don't even like surprises. I I'm a planner. I'm an organizer. I, I don't throw a surprise party for me. I don't like it. Don't invite people to my house at the last minute when I'm not prepared. I don't like it. But in my entertainment, I like the rug being pulled out from under me. I like the, the shock value of the, Oh my God. I didn't yeah. see that come. Uh, I, it, I like that. It's, it's, it's escapist for me. Yeah. And, and the, I mean, and, and it is the, the thing when you think of streaming and binging something, it's the thing that makes you stay up through the night 
you know, even though you say, okay, I'm exhausted. I'm dozing through this episode, but oh my God. Oh, now we got to watch the next one. And it's, it, it, it's a fascinating thing in entertainment, the addictive thing. And I think that streaming really mm-hmm. has, capitalizes on that right. in a great way. Right. Great way. I do like when something has like a good twist where you're like, oh, what? Like, I do yes. like those moments. But I find that like, even if I'm watching like Grey's Anatomy or Parenthood, like I take on that energy of if it's like a really sad episode or if there's like, you know, this incredibly emotional distraughtness, like I bring that energy with me the rest of the day. I feel like I'm so sensitive to watching certain things. So it's like, well, why not have the energy of Chandler Bing all day? (laughs) (laughs) Right. I mean, I'm sort of that way with animals. I, I Mm -hmm. really, I don't want to see anything happen to an animal. I don't even want to see any, I don't want to even sense animal cruelty mm-hmm. anywhere. I don't want to see it or know it. And it, it's partly why I couldn't see Avatar, the the most recent Avatar, because someone told me there's uh, they, something happens to animals in it. And I just don't want to know. I can't see it. Yeah, I saw like everybody's going crazy about the new Guardians of the Galaxy movie. It's the best Marvel movie, blah, 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 blah. But they say you hear about the raccoon's backstory and it's like heartbreaking. And I was like, yeah, no, I'm not seeing this. I don't want to see a sad raccoon. Like, I haven't seen any Marvel movies. Isn't that extraordinary? You know what? I didn't until like a year ago. I hadn't seen any of them. And then I got really into Sebastian Stan and I'll watch anything he's in now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know somebody that's in love with him that would do anything just to to be. In fact, if I, I could get Sebastian Stan to come to her birthday, I think I would be the queen. But well, it, she's going to have to fight me for it. So. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> <laughs> when was the first time that you saw yourself in a character where they were like relaying a lot of feelings that you had been through and that you had felt also all of them yeah i mean every single one as as soon as i start working on somebody it's it's coming from pieces of me and i'm finding things in my life that i uh and in me that i identify with for the character Um, I I think that's just sort of the way I always attack everything Mm -hmm. and what what would really happen here and how would I deal with this? And if if I was this person, what what would be my attitude about this? So it's so all of them, everything. Yeah. When you are preparing for a role, it's such a is there there are so many people have different ways of attacking a role, but I feel like. Is there such thing as being over prepared? Because you don't want to go into the situation like you've already been there before, but you also don't want to not know where you're coming from, your relationship to this person, et cetera. I don't think there is an over prepared thing. I mean, the only the only caveat I would say is, again, you know, you talk about sitcoms. uh, You can rehearse something to death. You can rehearse to me, rehearse the funny out of it Mm -hmm. that there's no uh, spontaneity or freshness, but, you know, I, but then again, I mean, I, if you're doing a, a play and it's a comedy, you're doing it every night over and over and over again. Right. But I, the caveat with that being that you have a different audience every night and audiences tend to react as a, as, as one. And what may be funny one night is not necessarily funny the next. And that's always the biggest shock for an actor when you're, you think, well, this is the, this is the cash cow comedy and here it is, here it is. And here's the punchline and dead silence. And you just right. think, whoa, whoa, what happened? Yeah. And then you also get taken off guard when you say you don't think something's funny and they start laughing. Yeah. So uh, you just never quite know, but no, I, I, I don't think you can be too prepared and I think that even in the process of doing a role, you are constantly having epiphanies about that character or situation or their relationships that that you maybe didn't see coming. Mm -hmm. And when you're on set, like when you're working with people like, you know, Ted Danson and Tom Selleck and Mike Myers, like these are all incredibly funny people. How much are you studying other people? And observing how they work while you're there. Constantly. Mm -hmm. Constantly. And 
Gosh, I mean, I did a horrible movie at the start of my career with Gene Hackman. And uh, it was a horrible, horrible movie. And I just remember uh, it was a comedy called Loose Cannons and uh, Dom DeLuise was in it. And Oh, uh, Dom. Yeah. I'm good friends with David DeLuise. Oh, talking? really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Dom DeLuise was in it. And um, oh, gosh. Who was one of the Blues brothers? The I'm blanking on his name. Belushi? Not Belushi, the other one. Oh, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, so we were doing this movie, and I, I remember it was early in my career, one of my first jobs, and I remember doing a scene with Gene Hackman, and he was so small. It was so, I thought, oh, my God, he's terrible. He's just not... He's not even acting. What is he doing? This is he's just like barely moving his mouth. He's not doing anything. And then, of course, come to see it. And he's brilliant. He's amazing. And, yeah. and he knew exactly how to act for the kids. So it was a whole lesson to me in, in just how to act for the camera. And it, it's not it's not necessarily about what you show. It's about what's going on internally. And the mm -hmm. camera sees it, sees all of it. So that was pretty incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's such a different muscle because, I mean, you still are doing plays, which I think is incredible. Like even when you're not. On I, have to. I, I love them. And I feel like that is my uh, that's my acting class. Mm -hmm. That's where I get to exercise a muscle that I, I don't, don't always get to do. Right. And, you know, on, in on the stage. Oh, Dan Aykroyd. That's oh, the name. Yes. The yeah. <laughs> this is the thing. That, welcome to my world. This is. <laughs> But on the stage, you know, you're you have to be much bigger and you're it's a lot of output where on camera, it's like you said, it's smaller and it's all internal. So is there a certain technique that you use to kind of switch you in and out of that? It, no, it not necessarily. I mean, it's literally uh, it's like if you're talking to somebody, how far away or how close are they? And mm -hmm. with a camera, you have to assume you're you're within whispering distance. And on stage, it's as if you are several, several feet away. So so you're projecting out for that. But but it, within that, you're still keeping the emotion real. You're still keeping you're, you're, you're being real. You're not overplaying it and oh, pushing it mm -hmm. uh, to project it. Right. Now, I always ask people, like, is there a character that you channel in your hard times? Like for me, I say this a million times on this podcast, but whenever I'm going through like a really rough time where I'm like, I just got to get through this, I channel Fiona Gallagher from Shameless because she just <laughs> she gets through all of it and she's so tough. And I'm like, all right, I need to pull my inner Fiona or like at work, like to keep me peppy. I'm like, well, I'm Rachel Green at the coffee shop. Like, that's who I am today. And so I'm not sure if you have that, but also if like you, there are certain things that you do throughout the day where you're like, oh, this kind of reminds me of a character that I played when I did this. Hmm. I mean, it's it. So first of all, when I started, my idol was Vivian Lee, and I had to know everything about Vivian Lee, and I hadn't even read Gone with the Wind yet or seen mm. the but I knew about Vivian Lee's romance with Laurence Olivier and I was obsessed with her. And then of course I saw Gone with the Wind and, and, I, and I think that for a long time, she was my role model. I mm. wanted to be, I wanted to be an actress like Vivian Lee. And mm. so, but then, you know, and that character, Scarlett O'Hara, like mm -hmm. after all, tomorrow is another day and just that I'm going to push through. But in my life, I mean, I don't really think of characters, but every once in a while, a line will pop into my head from a character that I played. And and I, I won't remember much of anything else about that character, but maybe the first line of a play or yeah, just things like that just kind of pop in. But it, it's completely not related to anything. It's usually when I'm walking the dog and I'm just <laughs> reassociating <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now with Vivian Lee, it's so like, I was going to ask you who like your North star was. Cause obviously mine's Jennifer Aniston. And I look at her career and I'm like, that's the career I could dream of. So growing up with Vivian Lee and was there, did you want to, did you want to be just like her or you wanted your career to be like hers or both? Well, interesting. I mean, so that was more of a childhood mm -hmm. 
in person infatuation, but I, I think I looked at, and like a lot of us, I looked at Meryl Streep mm-hmm. and I thought that I want to be that I want to be the person that can do theater and go do film. And, uh, and I didn't really figure television in it because at the time when I was starting television was the, you know, the ugly stepsister in a weird way. You were, you wanted to be a movie star and you didn't want to tie up your time with a television contract. And, uh, I, I just, thought, okay, well, I'll do two movies a year and I'll have a family and I'll I'll get swept off my feet and have a family and we'll travel the world and and everyone will come live with me on location and and I'll do my movies and it'll be all just this fantasy. Well, it's a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Um, And what I did come to realize is, first of all, the, my partner very much has his own life and career and can't just pick up and follow me all over the place. And I'm thankful for that. Uh, and also once I had children, I, I, I didn't want to be traipsing all over and even really, I wasn't being offered two movies a year. So <laughs> there, there's that. Um, and then a, a, an opportunity came for me in sitcoms in a show called almost perfect and I thought, well, this is great. It's a great part, better than I've been offered in movies. And I'll try this. And it keeps me in town. So in the entire time, and my kids are in their 20s, I've been doing television. And in that time, I think the quality of the programming on TV really rivals that of what you can even pay a ticket for to see in the theater. Mm-hmm. So it, it really has become amazing and and amazing not just stories but cinematography and and production value and everything really really amazing yeah you know as someone who has been a successful working actor in this industry for 30 plus years and you do have from my perspective the dream career of you're doing incredible sitcoms and you're doing classic movies cult classic movies and like movies that are iconic from three men and a baby. And I'm um, so I married an ax murderer. Like just so many things that are in the zeitgeist. And I had this question of like, you know, we hear of a lot of women, you know, thinking of the Brooke Shields documentary or, you know, those, those actresses that were really prominent in the eighties, nineties, early two thousands, all coming forward and saying like all these traumas that they had or addictions that didn't, nobody knew about, or, you know, eating disorders or this or that. And I look at you and I think like, how did you manage, was there a certain mindset, obviously your incredible talent has given you the longevity in this career, but a lot of it is also mindset to stay above the Hollywood bullshit, essentially. It's so, what all you, yeah. So, is there like a certain mantra that you have, or how have you navigated staying above all of these things? Well, interesting. I, I wouldn't say that I I have necessarily navigated that. I mean, I think that's um, a very hard thing to navigate. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I will say I went into this highly ambitious and I decided this is what I'm going to do and I'm going to succeed no matter what. There was never a doubt in my mind. And I still think that way pretty much, uh, even though I'm a lot older and it, it's I still think the best is yet to come in a crazy way, even mm-hmm. though the odds don't really aren't really in my favor in that way. But I I think I also went into this business. I grew up in suburbia in a very sheltered kind of world. And I was not prepared for what this business does and can do. And, and particularly to, to young women. Mm-hmm. So uh, not that I had anything horribly traumatic, but I definitely went through my share of male yeah. just nastiness, I would mm-hmm. say. And, and that is something that you have to learn to navigate. And and I think also, I came into this thinking, wow, this is, the, I'm an artist, I want to be a creative person, I'm an artist. And, and it is very much a business more than almost anything else. And, and that was the trick for me to navigate is how to get through this as a business. So uh, yeah, I, I would say, and I and, you know, P.S., I think the the Me Too movement, I, I don't know that it's ironically, I, I feel like the people that needed to really hear that turned a deaf ear and are mm-hmm. kind of, uh, and there's still 
kind of shocking things that that happen. But but I, I think it, it it's an educate. You can't know until you're in it. And and I'm not the, I'm a trusting person that's not a very confrontational person. So that is uh, it's it's a vulnerability to go into this business with that is probably, you know, you need that for your work. But at the same time, it's 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 very hazardous for the business side of things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's hard because we're all so sensitive and empathic. And like you said, that doesn't work when you're doing like a business deal. <laughs> yeah, we're just, you know, navigating like an asshole. So, right. Uh, but you learn by trial and error. You really do. And and honestly, I don't I don't think there is a woman in this business who has not had some kind of encounter, you know, that that runs the gamut of mm-hmm. uh, harassment in some way. Right. And, you know, I think, too, we also especially when we're younger, we fear saying no or being stern with people because we want to be hired. We don't want to lose opportunities. So then you're just it's on you're on thin ice all the time. And it feels yeah, right. Yeah, it feels very scary. Well, I don't know if you saw the latest Marilyn Monroe documentary. I can't remember what it's called, but it's the latest documentary about her life. And and what I feel found fascinating is that the portrait that you see of Hollywood, that that sexual harassment was part of the job. I mean, (sighs) women would line up in a room to be extras and it would just be, okay, take your tops off and we'll pick the person that has the best boobs and they get to be the extra in the movie. Mm -hmm. And a meeting with a studio executive or a, a studio head just automatically entailed the blowjob. I mean, it was, it was just, and that was just it. That was just how it is. Mm-hmm. And, and it is kind of shocking when you look at it, cause we have come a ways from that. Mm-hmm. I think, I, I hope, but um, it is kind of fascinating that that's the way business goes down sometimes. Yeah. 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 It's <laughs> like, why do I want to do this again? Because I love it. <laughs> You know, look, I mean, we're, we're off on a tangent and yeah. I, for that, it, for that is the, the, the minority of it all. I mean, the majority and certainly of everything that I've done, I've worked with fantastic people mm-hmm. that whom I highly respect. And, uh, even on the silliest, dumbest projects, possibly it's still been very rewarding and, um, and just great people and, and yeah. uh, experience. So I would say in general, we're all kind of in it for the same reasons, but, but everybody has a different work ethic. Mm -hmm. And I think too, like mental health wasn't talked about a lot. I feel like it wasn't talked about a lot until probably the last 10 years or so. And I could imagine being in this industry, there were a lot of things that affected your mental health, whether it be for the good or for the bad. What has helped you maintain your mental health throughout your career? I think I I have a very strong family. I have a very strong family ethic and I think they keep me in check. I mean, I, I, it, my personal world is very reality based and it's I'm surrounded by people who are not in the business and I'm surrounded by people that I also have to be either a mom or a friend or a wife or a daughter or just a, a regular person and even though they're, they're they may be proud of me I'm I'm still just me mm-hmm. and so hopefully my head doesn't get too big in that sense but but I also think that um, it is it is and I'm very thankful to have that because the ups and downs and the ride and the rejection and the, the fact of the matter is that the product you're selling is yourself. And that comes under great scrutiny. And it, it's 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 hard to take, I think, and, and for all of us. And and also I came into this business by my choice. And I was already older. I wasn't a child in this business. And I think it's a really, really tough place to grow up in. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I don't envy, I I haven't met a lot of children that, that come through it without some kind of scars. I mean, it's, it's just a very adult world and not a healthy adult world 
to grow up in. Right. So it's, it's very tricky, but I, I have worked with a lot of children and I have worked with, um, and I, I've noticed that those children often have parents that are vigilant in protecting their kids and making sure that they're as exposed to as little gross adultness as possible mm-hmm. um, and, and get time to be kids. Yeah. So, there are there are a lot of young people that love acting that love being a, a, a professional mm-hmm. so but it's hard were your parents actors at all not at all my mom was a stay at home mom who well, while we were growing up went back to college and got a masters in social work and my dad was a 9 to fiver for a, a electronics distribution company for wire cable tubing like he was a company man so not in this business at all. And when I said I wanted to pursue this, they didn't try to dissuade me, but they did caution me and say, it's very hard and mm-hmm. your chances of success are not as great as something more practical. So to that end, go to college, get a degree, uh, even though my degree was in acting. So at least you have a piece of paper. Right. If you want to do something else. And, and, you know, by the way, the piece of paper is worthless in this business. It's good. It's, right. but, but if I did want to do something else or, or get, go to higher education, then I have that. Oh, excuse me. Bless yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. I know. I got, I got dogs. I got phones. It's like, I'm surprised <laughs> I can even get through this thing at all. <laughs> so you are on a show now, speaking of preparation and schooling, I was wondering, I was watching Ride. It's your new show. It's on Hallmark Channel. You can also watch it on Peacock and I think Paramount Plus as well. And I was like, wow, this is one, a perfect role for you because I feel like you love animals and the outdoors. This show where you get to be with the horses and everything, like you were saying, it's so you seem so at ease in this element. But I was wondering how much ranch talk did you have to prepare for? Did you already know a lot of this stuff? I didn't know anything. I mean, I would fantasize about having a ranch because I I fantasize about having a place everywhere I go. But uh, we did. I had to learn how to ride horses, which was great, and learned a bit about ranching. We shot on a um, a 4,000 acre cattle ranch and it was a delight. But even more than that, I think, is is the role of Isabel McMurray for me, which mm. is a woman who is very much her own person and is not just a caricature or a, a two dimensional person in support of a male character. She is the show. I mean, yeah. and that gosh, I don't know that I've had that in my career. This might be the first time that I've been able to play a person who's very much her own person. Yeah, you're not you are raising kids, but that's not your whole identity of the show or, you know, you're in the kitchen, but you're not cooking the meals for everybody all day long. Yeah, right. Right. And I even in the course of doing it, because uh, the script would say, OK, Isabel makes breakfast and everybody comes in and it's like, you know what? No, Isabel probably doesn't have time to make breakfast. So maybe one of the sons is 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 the breakfast cooker. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and let's like let's whatever we can do to kind of knock down the, the change, change up the game, change the expectations, even though, look, I love to cook and I, uh, but just let's make this character not be the, the, the stock character that we're used to seeing over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And have you been taking horseback riding lessons? I was, and I haven't been, um, but uh, I hopefully will, continue i want to so i have to figure out where i can do that yeah i really love seeing you in this and it's like i said it's so fitting for you and it just feels so you're you're just at such ease with it and it's great and it's great to see and i'm excited to see where else it goes i mean i just finished the first episode so i'm i was like oh my gosh nancy driving a tractor (laughs) yeah that's another i didn't know how to do that i mean that's not you don't just get in and turn it on there's gears and stuff and moving and lifting the uh the bail lift and and there's Mm -hmm. all so it's um i do know as much as i love being on the ranch i don't think i i could not it's a hard life i i could not do that Um, yeah i I could imagine and yes you have to be up really early i don't think i could do that (laughs) (laughs) that's the least of it uh but it was very very beautiful country and i really enjoyed that 
Yeah. I think it's such an amazing thing because as we get older, I think we become more fearful of trying something new. Mm -hmm. And I think we get a little stuck in our routine and stuck in our ways. And so I think like you saying that, you know, you had to learn how to drive a tractor and ride a horse and like learn how to, how a ranch actually works. I think it's really admirable that, you know, you're still learning new things all the time and how important it is to be open to learning new things and what it could bring into your life. I don't think I could. I I think that's my MO. And I think that I, I, I always like to have a project. I can't sit still. And if I'm not learning something new all the time, I think that would be the end of me. I I think I need that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Nancy, I adore you so much. We can talk about a million things all the time. And like I said, like seeing you, even like the first couple of times I had met you, I said to you, like, thank you for always being so kind and so nice. And you really like when you are with people and you're having a conversation, you truly make it all about them. You listen, you're intentional and you truly ask like, Oh, how's everything with you? How's everything going in your life? How are your auditions? Like you're so personable and it truly has made, it's inspired me and influenced me to also pass that forward and be like that towards other people. And so I just want to thank you. And I just think you're amazing. The greatest compliment ever. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean it. I just think you are the best. Well, the feeling is mutual and there, congratulations. I don't know if you can see behind me, but here. Yeah, I saw another puppy. <laughs> one little monster just came in. Here, let me see. I, Come here, you, what are you barking at? Like such a maniac, such a maniac. Here's, I don't know if you can see this guy. Oh, hi. This is oh little, he's a crazy boy. Barking. So barking cute. Boy. Hi. So oh, cute. my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, thank you so very much. That was a little, I don't know if you can edit this, but. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's fine. I'll keep a puppy in there. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, of course. So before you leave, I want to ask, what is the most useful piece of advice you've gotten for your mental health or for your that you've gotten or that you would give? Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, For mental health, I think the best thing I could say is to breathe and know that that it isn't always about you. And we take so much on and blame ourselves for so much and criticize ourselves. And sometimes it has nothing to do with us at all. And especially in this business with so much rejection and everything else, and we turn ourselves inside out to try to fit into whatever peg size is being asked for. And and sometimes it just isn't about you. So I think that's pretty much the best thing. And I have to consciously sometimes step away and say, you know what, walk, leave it. It's not about you. Yeah, I love that. It's so hard not to take things personal, but it's so true. It's almost always never about you and it's not personal. Nope. And even look, I've I've been yelled at by people and and, uh, mistreated sometimes. And and even though it, it is directed towards me, it's towards me directly and it's not acceptable. Um, and I do have to stand up for myself, which is hard for me to do. But at the same time, I have to also say, you know what, it's not about you, whatever they're saying or whatever they're yelling. Uh, it's not about you. It's about them. Right. Right. And most of the time, like, you know, it's hard cause you, you have to be quote unquote, the bigger person and find that compassion because most of the time when people are taking things out on you, it's cause they're coming from a place of deep fear and deep hurt themselves. And you just have to, in order to make peace with it yourself and say, okay, it's not about me is just realize that and have compassion towards that person. I mean, you don't have to take any disrespect. You can still stick up for yourself, but it does make it easier when you realize like hate comes from fear. Meanness comes from fear. So right. Right. And don't let it keep you up at night. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or change who you are. Right. Don't let it change who you are. Who Mm -hmm. you are is just fine. Mm -hmm. And now I wanted to ask you one more thing. I know I'm like, I want to ask you one more thing. Um, (laughs) 
I saw that you are coming out with a movie with Hilary Swank and to tie this all in because she's playing a hairdresser Mm -hmm. and it's based on a true story. And I know you from the salon. So can you tell me about that project and when it'll be out? Yeah. So it's a movie called Ordinary Angels and it's based on a true story uh, about a family in the Midwest who um, uh, the mother passes away and the father's left with two young daughters and the youngest daughter needs a kidney transplant. And uh, and Hillary Swank plays a town hairdresser who hears about their plight and wants to help out any way they can. And I play uh, the grandma to these little girls and I'm trying to help my son navigate this whole thing. Uh, but it'll be out in October and uh, it's a pretty special movie. It's really, it's, it's uplifting and heartwarming and it's everything that you, Brittany, can see. So you don't have to run from it or hide from it. It's going to make you feel good. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's so funny. I'm like, okay, well, it, what's, it's so interesting because people know me so well and they go, oh, Brittany wouldn't like this. Oh, no, you could watch this one. Like it's people filter <laughs> movies for me. So I love that you've joined that that club now. <laughs> You're in. You can go see that one. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that's amazing. I know at first I almost didn't think I could finish So I Married an Axe Murderer because I was like, just, just you chopping the meat in the deli. I was like, oh my God, I'm never going to eat again. Like... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, things do that to you, don't they? I know. I'm like, oh, God. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Nancy. Well, thank you so much for doing this. And thank Thank you you so much for being here. My pleasure. Yeah, I hope to do it again. Thanks a lot. And I'll see you next week. (laughs) Bye. See you later. Bye-bye.